In this lecture, I will discuss DNA, RNA, DNA replication, and protein synthesis. One of the greatest scientific arguments of last century centered over what cellular structures were the units of inheritance. Was it DNA, histones, proteins? Or was it uh, some incredibly complex substance that yet undiscovered? In one sense, the genetic material was discovered by Gregor Mendel, since his experiments strongly indicated uh, physical particulate factors that replicated in cell division, segregated in gamete formation, was transmitted from generation to generation, and in some way directed the development of the organism. But what precisely was this material? There was a strong indication of ties between particular bodies called chromosomes and inheritance. But what was the chromosomes exactly? The word chromosomes means colored body. Chromosomes are not actually colored in nature, but the phosphate groups of their DNA bind certain dyes very strongly. And so chromosomes were first seen as brightly stained objects, actually brightly stained DNA. Surprisingly, DNA itself was discovered in Mendel's lifetime. In 1869, Friedrich Mescher, a German biochemist, wanted to reveal chemical composition of the cell nuclei. He used enzyme to eliminate the presence of all proteins within those organelles. What was left was a transparent mucus-like substance. At that time, Mescher did not know that it's fun what the functions of this substance were. Decades later, it was shown that what he discovered was one of the most important molecules for life forms in this planet. An informational polymer, a master molecule that contains the code for the production of every single protein in a cell in all living creatures, eyes of humans, plants, fungi, bacterial cells, thus controlling all biochemical processes within living cells. In the early 1880s, Albert Kassel further purified the substance and discovered its highly acidic properties. Kassel isolated and described the five organic compounds that are present in nucleic acids, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil. These compounds were later known to be a key in the formation of DNA and RNA, the genetic material found in all living cells. Walter Sutton argued that chromosomes are the mechanism of how traits are passed on from parents to offspring. Furthermore, he supported Gregor's Mendel 1865 theory of independent assortment and segregation of hereditary factors, which we're going to discuss later during these lectures. Walter uh, Sutton argued that each parent passes on half set of chromosomes to their offspring. He concluded that chromosomes contain hereditary units and their behavior during meiosis is random. His work formed the basis for the chromosomal theory of heredity. Another scientist, Theodore Bavari, independently from Sutton, developed similar theories about the role of chromosomes in heredity while working with sea urchins in Germany in 1900. Scientists credited both Sutton and Bavari with the theory of inheritance, also called a Sutton-Bavari theory. 
The sudden Bavarian the chromosome theory is a fundamental unifying theory of genetics, which identifies chromosomes as the carriers of genetic material. Danish botanist Wilhelm Johansson coined the word genes to describe the Mendelian units of heredity. He also made the distinction between the outward appearance of an individual's phenotype and its genetic traits genotype. Four years later, William Batson, an early geneticist and proponent of Mendelian ideas, had used the word genetics in a letter. He felt the need for a new term to describe the study of heredity and inherited variations. But the term didn't uh, start spreading until uh, Wilhelm Johansson suggested that Mendelian factors of inheritance be called genes. The proposed word traced from the Greek word genos, meaning birth. The words spawned other like genome. In 1911, gene theory was proposed by Thomas Morgan. The gene theory is one of the basic principles of biology. The main concept of this theory is that the traits are passed from parents to offspring through gene transmission. Genes are passed from parents to offspring through reproduction. But what are genes? What are they made of? Are they made of DNA, histones, or another type of proteins? Later in 1914, a German chemist named Robert Fleugan invented a still widely used staining procedure, Fleugan procedure, that is specific for DNA. The Fleugan staining procedure has an advantage of staining DNA more or less strongly according to how much it is present. Thus, amount of DNA present can be calculated by measuring strengths of the color. A few key experiments revealed that virtually every cell nucleus in given plant or animal has the same amount of DNA, ex ex except, of course, for gametes, eggs and sperm, which have half of that amount. Could it be, uh, could it be that DNA is genetic material? Of course, you already know it is, but it was a great puzzle to an early generation. Most biologists couldn't bring themselves to uh, take DNA seriously for very uh, convincing reasons. In the first place, the structure of DNA is very simple. Just four different nucleotides are present. How could anything so simple uh, be the physical basis of anything so wonderful as genes? How could four nucleotides produce wondrous variations of life? The second place, DNA didn't seem to do anything. It just sat there, some scientists said, probably uh, holding the chromosomes together or making it acid or doing something trivial. But chromosomes also contain proteins. Ah, proteins! Now there was a likely source of variation. Proteins are wonderfully complex and do all kinds of marvelous things. So all bets were on proteins, providing one was willing to believe that genes were chemical at all. Not every biologist has given up ideas about such things as vital forces and other mystical and unexplainable things. Genes were thought of simply a developmental information and the idea of informational molecules didn't yet have been worked out. If this is all seems absurd to us now, remember that even today, no one knows whether our own memories are encoded in chemical form. In 1928, a bacteriologist, Fred Griffith, conducted what seemed to be an old ball experiment, but one that uh, proved to be a classic. He was studying the virus disease producing capability of two strains of um, uh, Streptococcus pneumonia, the bacteria that cause pneumonia. One was dangerous and one harmless. 
The virulent disease producing strain produced a smooth gummy polysaccharide that seemed to protect it from the host defenses. The hardened strain didn't. When grown on agar, on petri, uh, in, uh, on agar in petri dish, uh, the uh, harmful strain produced smooth colonies. The harm extract lacked proper enzymes to coat themselves and produce rough colonies. When Griffiths injected smooth strain bacteria into the mice, mice died. When he injected rough uh, strain bacteria into the mice, mice didn't die. He then killed some smooth strain bacteria by heating them and injected their bacterial corpses into more mice. The mice did not die. So far he had shown uh, that the smooth polysaccharide itself didn't kill the mice when the bacteria were dead. But then Griffiths mixed dead smooth strain bacteria with live rough strain bacteria both of which had proved to be harmless and injected mixture into still more mice. This mice came down with the severe pneumonia and died. At this point, you might pause and make your own best guess about what was happening. Did the chemical remains of the smooth strain bacteria help the rough strain to do its dirty work? To confuse things, mouse autopsy shows that the, died, that the dead mice were full of virulent, living, smooth bacteria. Where did they come from? Griffith thought that perhaps he had erred in his experimental technique. So he repeated the experiment with great care again and again. The results were clearly not due to accidental contamination. The dead smooth strain of pneumococci were dead, all right. As Sherlock Holmes said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever is left must be the true, no matter how improbable. It didn't seem likely that apparently the living rough strain pneumococcus had somehow been transformed by material from the dead smooth strain and had become smooth. <clears throat> Griffiths had transformed one strain of bacteria into another, but his experiment raised as many questions in Griffiths' mind as it answered. He did not know what had caused the change in the bacteria. Was the transforming factor a protein or was it DNA? At 1944, Oswald Avery and team of scientists at Rockefeller University decided to repeat Griffith's experiment in an attempt to discover the identity of the transforming factor. They determined that it was DNA that transformed the harmless bacteria into disease-producing bacteria. The DNA had changed the characteristic of the harmless strain. Still, many scientists argued against the conclusions of Avery and his team. Additional proof of the importance of DNA came in 1952 from so-called Blende experiment conducted by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. They used radioactive isotopes to label DNA and proteins. Their results indicated that DNA was the transforming factor and therefore the carrier of genetic information. Still, no one had very much of an idea of how DNA worked. Genes were known to produce enzymes, which are complex protein. The big question was how could a molecule with only four different subunits determine the specificity of protein, which is composed of 20 different amino acids? The next thing to do was to look at molecules as closely as possible and from every possible angle. For a long time, it had been thought that the basic subunits, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, occurred on equal frequencies. In fact, it was once believed that the basic units of DNA was a simple repeating tetranucleotide consisting of one of, uh, of four different nucleotides. 
But then in 1950s, Erwin Charkov showed that DNA from different sources had different base ratio, that is different frequencies of four subunits. As Chargoff looked at the DNA of more and more organisms, he found increasingly different ratios, but he also discovered one general rule. The number of adenine nucleotides in his samples was always equal to the number of thymine nucleotides, and the number of guanine nucleotides was always equal to the number of cytosine nucleotides. Or in short, A equal T and G equal C. A most interesting observation, of course. We know the reason of this equalities now, but to Chargoff they were only intriguing, mysterious observations. Nevertheless, they were the key that help other scientists to work out the structure and function of the Lysky molecule. There was a work of another scientist um, that helped to uh, unveil the mystery of, of structure of DNA. In 1952, Linus Pauling proposed a three-chained helical structure of DNA. Hampered by inadequate data, he was mistaken. Still, Pauling's strategic approach to his research as well as to his scientific discoveries established him as a founding father of molecular biology. First, he worked to understand the structure of the subunits that make up the larger molecules. Then he determined how they could link together. He used the basic rules of chemistry and physics to limit and guide the hypothesis. Finally, he built models to test and elaborate his idea. By using this approach, Pauling was able to make fundamental advances in determining the shapes of bi biomolecules. And these achievements then allowed him to investigate how chemical structures determine biological functions. In 1954, he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his research into the nature of chemical bond and its application to the elucidation of the structure of complex substances. He also won 1962 Nobel Prize, making him the only person to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. So the main question in our lecture is still unanswered. What DNA looks like? What is the structure of molecule of DNA? One of the key devices in cracking the problem of how DNA is constructed was a tool that physicists, geologists, and chemists used to explore the fine structure of crystals. In 1952, PhD student uh, uh, Raymond Kaslan used the X-ray crystallography technique to make famous now picture known as Photo 51. Photo 51 is the picture of DNA molecule. It's been made by using X-ray diffraction uh, and known as X-ray diffraction image of DNA. Uh, Raymond Kasselin was working under supervision of Rosalind Franklin. Neither he nor her were able to read this image. The perfect picture was made, but what is this? How, what is the structure of DNA molecule? This question still remained unanswered. The following year, James Watson and Franci from Francis Creek took a, took a look at this image, and they immediately realized that the DNA has structure of a double helix. Using Pauline's strategic approach, they uh, finally assemble all the pieces of the puzzle that had been accumulated for 80 years. The discovery of the structure of DNA may be the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century. 
even to many biologists, X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA might as well be a Rorschach ink blood test in detecting personality disorders. But to Watson, Crick, and others schooled in X-ray crystallography, this pattern was a thing of beauty, actually suggesting the helical structure of DNA. The dark upper and lower patterns represent the dense packing of atoms in the nitrogen bases at the core of DNA, while X-shaped central pattern is the interpreted as a helical structure. From patterns like this, scientists have deduced the structure of DNA, RNA, and many complex proteins. So let's take a closer look at the precise DNA structure. Before the precise structure of DNA had been described, it had been already established that adenine always pairs with thymine and that guanine always pairs with cytosine. The nitrogenous bases were called complementary bases since each complement each other. There are two groups of them. One, one is purines and another pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine belongs to purines and thymine and cytosine belongs to pyrimidines. As it is apparent from the slide, uh, pyrimidines, it's a one ring uh, molecules, why purines has two rings in its structural formula. There is a little trick for how to remember which of those molecules belong to which groups. Note that those that belong to pyrimidines have Y in its spelling. Remember when we talked about a structure of macromolecules, we talked that they are polymers and they consist of monomers. Carbohydrates consist, carbohydrates consist of simple sugars. Proteins consist of amino acids. Uh, fat, uh, now, uh, lipids consist, most of them consist of glycerol and fatty acids. Well, what DNA consists of? What a monomer of DNAs? DNA are nucleotides. What you see on this slide is the a general structure of the nucleotide. It has phosphate group. It has a five carbon sugar. Here it is. In DNA, this is deoxyribose. And it has nitrogenous base. Each of the nucleotide consists of a nitrogenous base. It could be either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Yes, alphabet of life turned out to consist of four letters. No wonder that to the scientific community it was a surprise that DNA molecule is an informational molecule containing the code for life, since many of the scientists suspected that a code might be carried by proteins. So here's a question to you. Why had scientists primarily suspected that the code of life is in proteins? Press pause if you have to think a little bit about this. You're correct if you say because proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. So the coding variations could be much greater. As you recall, the scientists who demonstrated that DNA uh, is an inheritance molecule was Oswald Avery. He showed that this molecule is the molecular material of chromosomes and genes. For his discovery, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize three times, but never got the prize. Swedish biochemist and a Nobel Prize winner Arner uh, Tiselius said that Avery was the most deserving scientist not to receive the Nobel Prize for his work. Let's go back to the structure of DNA molecule. Here what you see are complementary bases as we call them. Thymine always goes with adenine. And here it is. 
Cytosine always goes with guanine. Here it is. But please pay attention to a one interesting detail. How many hydrogen bonds adenine and thymine has? How many hydrogen bonds cytosine and guanine has? Here's the numbers. Thymine forms two hydrogen bonds with adenine, right? And cytosine and guanine form three hydrogen bonds with each other. Crick and Watson were the first to describe the model of DNA molecule. In April 25, 1953, they reported their findings in the scientific journal Nature. Their article is often referred to as a pearl because it is concise content that reveals one of the greatest mystery of life. As they reported, the DNA molecule is a double helix similar to a twisted ladder. The sides of the ladder are made up of joint sugar phosphate molecules, and the runs of the ladder are made from pairing and bases or nitrogenous bases held together by hydrogen bonds. Here's a simplified version of this, but it's incomplete. See if you can complete this. Here we have uh, nitrogenous bases on one strand. So what nitrogenous bases will be on the strand next to it? What is next to adenine? What will be next to thymine, guanine, and so on? Here you see nitrogenous bases, bases or complementary bases uh, correctly corresponding one to each other. Adenine pairs with thymine, thymine with adenine, guanine with cytosine, and so on. But what is missing on this diagram? After we uh, wrote down uh, all the correct bases next to each other, we have to add what? Hydrogen bonds, here they are, hydrogen bonds. Adenine forms two hydrogen bonds with thymine, right? Thymine with two with adenine, and guanine and cytosine, they actually have three hydrogen bonds. One of the important things DNA uh, does, it's, it's replicates itself when uh, cells divide. When cells divide in the process called mitosis, the chromosomes first du duplicate themselves and uh, carry out over the two new cells in the, uh, uh, and the process is complete. Each new cell contains the entire sets of chromosomes of a parent cell. In theory, DNA replication is exceedingly simple. Each of the two strands of the DNA's double helix has the information necessary to create its complementary strand. That's because guanines always lined up with cytosines and adenines always lined up with thymines. So if you pull the strand apart, each could only be copied in one way and the result will be two copies of the original double helix. Of course, in real life, it is always much more complicated than theories. And so the actual way that DNA replicates takes more steps than this. And in fact, the whole process isn't uh, yet fully understood. In order for a strand of DNA to copy itself, it uh, must first unwind. The weak hydrogen bonds between the base pairs break and the two strands separate. This allows free DNA nucleotides present in the nucleus of a cell to match up with the complementary basis of two separate strands. The original strands act as a template or a pattern for the construction of the new DNA strand. Strands, right? Each new strand consists of one side of old ladder and a complementary new strand from the material floating in the nucleus of the cell. So hopefully now you understand why we call DNA replication 
semi-conservative replication. Semi means somewhat, conservative means old. So one strand of DNA always contains all strand of DNA and another strand of DNA contains new strand of DNA. Let's see if you understand and were able to follow everything I said. This is an incomplete, simple diagram of semi-conservative DNA replication. What I want you to do, I want you to complete it on your own. Let's see if you can do it correctly. I want you to pause the video for now and complete the diagram. Good luck. Later we will check it out if you did it correctly. So how did you do? Were you able to complete it? I hope first what you did, you put the nu complementary nucleotide one next to each other on the parent strand of DNA. And then you uh, indicated the hydrogen bonds in between them. Then you put the two, uh, you realize the two strands have to separate from each other like this. Hydrogen bonds are broken, right? The molecule of uh, DNA unwinds, and we have one strand of all uh, that we refer as an old DNA moving away from another strand of DNA. So you put complementary bases this way, as you see on the slide. You see, also you label that this is the parent strand, all strand of the DNA. You see, here's a parent strand. So two of them moved away from each other. The next step, what you did, you added the complementary bases. Where are they coming from? Where they are always floating there in the nucleoplasm. And then they are matching up at the uh, template strand uh, of the DNA. During DNA replication, here I put, or you put it on one and another strand. And of course, you didn't forget to put the hydrogen bonds. Now we'll have to understand a process called protein synthesis, or building of proteins, or protein production. As you know, protein, without proteins, there will be no life on this planet. Proteins, they have all these marvelous functions they do, endless style kind of functions. Please, but first, please recall what are building blocks of proteins. What are they made of? Of course, the answer is amino acids. The DNA molecule contains inform information needed to determine the sequence of amino acid in proteins. The assembly of proteins takes place outside of the nucleus on the ribosomes. The transfer of information from DNA to the ribosomes occurs through the messenger RNA molecule, abbreviated as mRNA. In order to understand how this happens, you will have to become familiar with the basic structure of RNA. RNA molecule is a kissing cousin of DNA molecule, but much, but much smaller than DNA. Uh, it's also usually single-stranded molecule. Let's compare DNA and RNA to see the differences. First of all, uh, Time, uh, timing found only in DNA. RNA doesn't contain timing. What we find both in DNA and RNA molecule are adenine, cytosine, and guanine. What we find only in RNA is uracil. Now, they have also different sugars. In RNA, our DNA contains dioxyribose. Please note, DE stands without, so deoxyribose. You see here, one oxygen is missing in the molecule of, of the deoxyribose. In a RNA molecule, we have a ribose, 
here is the sugar ribose structural formula of the ribose. What found both in DNA and RNA is a phosphate group. What, and now we will talk about protein synthesis. Since you have an understanding of both DNA and RNA molecules. Let's take a look at the first steps of protein synthesis. What has to happen first? Molecule of DNA is double-stranded. So the molecule, this molecule has to unzip. There is a special enzyme that help molecule of the DNA unzip. Thus, uh, hydrogen bonds are broken and DNA strand is exposed to the nucleoplasm. Now the message that is coded on the DNA strand has to be transcribed into messenger RNA molecule. The process by which the DNA message is copied onto a strand of messenger RNA is called transcription. Nucle nucleotides that will make messenger RNA are actually floating within the nucleoplasm in there. So let's build up the messenger RNA molecule now. Next to G is going to be what? C. Next to G, another G would be what? Another C. Next to C would be G. Next to A will be, students always, very, not always, but often make mistakes. What will be next to the A? U. I don't know why students put T in there. Uh, they either forget that uh, um, RNA molecule doesn't have timing, or maybe they think uh, they are doing working on another strand of DNA molecule. But let's move on. So next uh, letter is going to be U. Next letter, U. Next letter would be, next to C would be G. Guanine, right? Next to T will be A, adenine. And next to next T is going to be, of course, another adenine. So now messenger RNA is made. Here it is strand. It's a single stranded molecule, right? Now messenger RNA now is going to carry instructions that direct the assembly of a specific protein to a designated area on a ribosome. The instructions are carried in a series of sequences of three nitrogenous bases called codons. Here they are. One codon is CCG. Here, as you could see, another UUU. And uh, the third one is GAA. Those codons are on messenger RNA strand. What has to happen next? Well, the molecule has or me, molecule messenger RNA has to travel to ribosomes. So it moves out of the nucleus of the cell and goes into the ribosome. Here now uh, the codons position themselves on the ribosomes. Uh, mRNA arrived to the ribosome. And this means instructions are there on a ribosome. So what do we need now? What molecules? What is protein made of again? Amino acids. So amino acids now have to arrive to the ribosome. For uh, the, their arrivals, transport RNA molecules are responsible. Once message has reached the ribosome, the, proteins are, the protein is ready to be assembled. The process of building the protein from messenger RNA instructions is called translation. Why translation? Because we translate from the language of nitrogenous bases into a language of amino acids. Transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA are involved in translation. 
transfer RNA is responsible for carrying amino acids, the building blocks of proteins to the ribosomes. So they uh, can be linked in the specific order that makes up a single protein. And here you could see transport uh, RNA ready to pick up the right amino acid. One end of the transfer RNA carries a three base sequence called anticodon, which will match up with a particular codon on the mRNA. You see, if this codon is uh, GGC, it will arrive to the, if, if this anticodon is, sorry, anticodon is GGC, this uh, tRNA will arrive to the uh, codon CCG. And here you could see the amino acids that are ready to be picked up by a specific uh, transfer RNA. You see, GGC will always pick up alanine. It's not going to pick up phenylalanine or glutamic acid. Uh, those uh, sequences here and transport RNA are very specific. They're like a little taxis that are going to drive amino acid to the right terminal on the ribosome. And here we go, GGC pickups alanine, then uh, AAA becomes phenylalanine, and CUU becomes glutamic acid. So the next step, the amino acids travel to be positioned on messenger RNA. And here are, they are, GGC next to CCG. Now, CUU that brings uh, glutamic acid next to GAA. And phenylalanine arrives to the terminal UUU, right? Here we have another um, type of RNA called ribosomal RNA that helps bind the amino acids together to form the final protein. As you could see here, they, so far they do not have the bonds. The bonds have to be created. A pept we call these bonds peptide bonds. They are type of covalent bonds, but just to make it specific, uh, so we know that we are talking about peptides or proteins, we call them peptide bonds. Here we have one bond, formed and another bond is formed. Protein synthesis stops when a termination codon is read on the messenger RNA. After synthesis is stopped, the new protein is released uh, uh, for the from the ribosomes for the use throughout the cell. Every protein a cell produces is directly related to the order of the bases in the messenger RNA and the sequence of bases of messenger RNA is complementary to the sequence of the bases of DNA. In other words, DNA is the ultimate blueprint for the formation of proteins. In 1957, Francis Crick used this logic to propose what is uh, now known as central dogma. The central dogma is shown uh, that uh, DNA uh, is shown as DNA, uh, DNA, DNA replication, we mean, or DNA, RNA, protein, protein synthesis. It illustrates the flow of information needed to build proteins. Since this is a science lecture, you may be surprised to hear the word dogma. Dogma usually refers to something that cannot be questioned and is generally reversed for matters of religion and politics. In a sense, the only proper dogma in science is that there is no dogma and anything can be questioned. The term central dogma was originally meant as a joke of sorts, initiated by Crick, but the name stuck. The reason serious scientists accept the term dogma are first the simplicity of the statements. Second, the virtual universal acceptance of the term by biologists. And most of all, the absence of any real evidence that these are the only ways in which 
biological information is preserved and passed on. That is uh, the really the dogmatic part. The central dogma completed the intellectual process began by Mendel and gave our concept of life, including human life, a rigorous chemical and physical basis. Of course, there are still important details to be worked out. Many smaller mysteries remain to be solved. And some questions perhaps may never be answered. But the essence of this life process is understood. So what is the central dogma? Simply this. All DNA is copied from another DNA, a process called replication. All RNA is copied from DNA, the process called transcription. All proteins are copied from RNA in such a way that three sequential RNA nucleotides bases specify one amino acid in a protein chain using a genetic code that is the same for all organisms, the process called translation. As it happens, scientists quickly found exceptions to, this, to the rules that we just discussed. But as far as we know, the exceptions occur only in certain viruses. For some viruses, viral RNA is copied from uh, viral RNA, RNA replication. For other viruses, viral DNA is copied from viral RNA. DNA-dependent RNA synthesis, or reverse transcription. These exceptions are usually discussed with my microbiology students. But for us, these exceptions, just to keep in mind, and if you would like to know more, you can always op find open textbook of microbiology and read about this. Perhaps I'm going to have one of the lecture later on. I will post lecture on this topic. But for now, we finish with protein uh, replication and protein synthesis. But as we usually do, let's see how you understand the topic. I'm going to quickly review this and ask you a couple of questions. And hopefully you will be able to answer those questions. So let's start. Before I want to remind you, Messenger RNA carries the blueprint for the protein from the DNA to the ribosome. This process by which the DNA message is copied onto a strand of mRNA called transcription. Now, steps of transcription. An enzyme unzips a single gene on the DNA molecule. The nitrogenous bases of DNA are exposed to the nitrogenous bases floating freely in the nucleoplasm. The mRNA gets built using the DNA nucleotides as a blueprint. So here's the questions to you. If a C is on the uh, a DNA, what nitrogenous base will be there on messenger RNA? And so, so on concerning uh, guanine, thymine, and adenine. I hope your questions were as follows. Guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. Not timing, uracil. The next question is, if the template a DNA sequence is GGCAAACTT, what will be the corresponding messenger RNA sequence? I hope your answer was CCGUUUGAA. So now let's review trans translation. Messenger RNA binds to the ribosome, correct? Messenger RNA starts giving its instructions how to build a protein using amino acids. Question to you. In what form does messenger RNA contain instruction for translation? I hope that your answer was those instructions are contained in the sequences that the messenger RNA copied from DNA. The letters are read in groups of three. Each of these groups are called uh, a codon. Question. In the sequence of mRNA, CCG, UUU, GAA, how many codons are there? Of course, three. A codon represents a, a specific amino acids. 
Only a few codon do not represent amino acid. Instead, they tell the ribosome where to start and stop making protein. Question to you. Using a table on this slide, write down the codons which do not represent amino acid. You see, what you see here is the table uh, known as the genetic code. Here you could see the amino acid corresponding to the triplet code in messenger RNA. So, what of the, of, of the codons do not represent amino acid? It shouldn't be very hard. Take a good look, but please press pause on the video before you answer. Here's the answers. UAA, UAG, and UGA. Why? Because look, the way this table is organized, first you see the first letter, second letter, and the third letter, right? So which one, where don't we see uh, amino acids? Here, where you see the starts, no amino acid. So what would be uh, actually the genetic code for this? Here it is. We start with first letter U, second letter A, and the third letter A. So UAA. Now the next one we see here, U. Then we see the second letter is A. And the third letter is G. So U, A, G. Here it is. Those stars, uh, stars represent chain terminators. If this is red on the uh, ribosomes, if this uh, part of messenger RNA red, so protein synthesis stops, right? And another one is U, G, A, right here. It's another chain terminator sequence, correct? Here we are moving with another steps. Transfer RNA brings amino acid to the ribosomes. One end of the transfer, uh, transfer RNA carries a three-base sequence called anticodon. An anticodon matches up with a particular codon on mRNA. So obviously the questions are, at what codon will be the anticodon AAA arrive? At what codon will be the anticodon GGC arrive? At what codon will be the anticodon CUU arrive? Here are the answers. I hope you understand why. If not, you will have to start watching the lecture from the beginning. Here we're reviewing another steps of uh, the process. Ribosomal RNA helps link the amino acid in a specific order that makes up a single protein. Then protein synthesis stops when the terminator coda is read on the messenger RNA. The protein floats loose from the ribosomes and falls into a very specific shape, depending on the sequence of amino acids, of course. So now, using the table on the left, write down the amino acids coded by the following codons. UUU, GAA, and so on. Let me help you with the first one. U, U, U. So what do you want to write down there next to it? Phenylalanine. Correct. The second one is G, A, A. Glutamic acid. Now C, C, G. So C, C, G. Proline. A, A, G. A, A, G. Lysine. Now using the same table, write down the codons for the following amino acids. Threonine. Let's find threonine first. Here we have not one, but uh, more than one, about four of them in the table. 
So what do we want to write down there? A, C, A, right? A, C, C, A, C, G, and A, C, U. The next is arginine. And here's the answers. Now, press pause and try to do on your own cysteine. The answer is UGC, UGU. Methionine. Press pause and write down the answer. The answer is AUG. Leucine. The answer is CUA, CUC, CUG, and CUU. Now, what will happen if the codon UAA is read on the ribosome? The answer is protein synthesis will stop. And I hope you understand why. Because U a A is a sequence of chain terminator. Here is another question to you. What is the transcription? Simple. Transcription equals DNA, RNA. We copy, uh, messenger RNA copies uh, the information from DNA. What is translation? Answer is translation is RNA protein. Actually, translate another word for translation is protein synthesis. And what is the central dogma? Well, first of all is DNA replication, DNA, DNA. And the next is protein synthesis, right? So DNA, the information goes as follows. DNA, RNA, protein. Now our lecture comes to the end. Thank you for your attention. And our next lecture is going to be on mutations. Bye. <music>